Hey everyone, how's it going? So it's gonna be a pretty brief video today. We're gonna to be talking about the role of outliers in machine learning algorithms, and then also talk about ways that people typically deal with outliers, as well as some of the shortcomings of those methods. In general, I think outliers are a pretty interesting topic for two main reasons. One is that even if you don't study stats, this word outlier has become kind of a commonplace word, even in the media and just speech, for example, we'll say, oh, that baseball game was an outlier. And we just mean that it was different from a typical baseball game, for example. The other reason I think it's interesting is that even with all these statistical tools we have, there's not like a set way to deal with outliers. It really depends on the problem. Different people will take different approaches. So it really highlights this fact that math is not this yes or no set in stone kind of process, but it really depends on the situation. So we'll go about this video pretty simply. We'll just go through four different very popular machine learning algorithms and talk about the impact that a couple of outliers can have on the results. And then as I said, we'll talk about some common ways people deal with outliers. By the way, I got this really cool lobster hat for Christmas. Hope you like it. So let's begin by visiting our very first friend in machine learning and stats, which was linear regression. So if you remember linear regression, you just have a X and a Y variable, keeping it real simple, and you draw a line of best fit through all of your data points. So let's say all of these black X's were your initial data points, and you drew this green line of best fit through them, and they have a pretty good fit, no real issues there. Now here's the problem. Let's say you introduce a couple of outliers. So these red X's down here with the exclamation point next to them are outliers because they are very different from the typical black X's we have up here. As you might have learned in linear regression, this line that we're gonna draw now is very affected by outliers. And what's gonna happen is that the slope of the line or beta one hat in this form over here is going to shift down so that the new line we get is this red line and the biggest issue with this red line, you can see what it's trying to do. It's trying to kind of compromise between the original data and these outliers, but in doing so, it doesn't really capture either one too well. So we definitely have an issue with outliers in linear regression. It turns out that we can also frame logistic regression, which might have been the first uh, classification technique you learned, in the exact same way. Just a quick recap, models the logit of the probability of any example being either zero or one as this same form, beta naught plus beta one X, just like we had up here. So let's say our initial data is these black X's, which were all class zero, and these black X's, which are all class one. And we asked to draw the sigmoid, which is going to predict the probability of each example being in class one. And without the presence of outliers, this would be pretty simple. We just draw this black sigmoid so that all of these get correctly classified as class one because their probabilities are above 0.5 and all these guys get correctly classified as class zero because their probabilities are below 0.5. Now again, we introduced just a couple of outliers. So here's some outliers here, these three red X's, and I've drawn this red arrow to indicate that they are way over here in the X direction. So they are way to the right, have very large values. Now let's think about first mathematically what's gonna to happen to the sigmoid. Actually, the same thing happens because we are modeling it again as beta naught plus beta one X. So our beta one hat again goes down. And the impact that having a lower beta one hat is going to have on this sigmoid is that it's going to flatten out and stretch out the sigmoid. So it now looks like this red sigmoid here. And more intuitively, you can see what's going on is that because these three red X's have very large values of the X variable, yet they are classified as class zero, we get this situation where the sigmoid is trying its best to incorporate these into the class zero which it tries to achieve by stretching out the sigmoid so much that they get incorporated into the lower part of the sigmoid. But in trying to do so, it completely destroys the rest of our data. For example, if you look at this sigmoid now, you see that everything below 0.5, so these are all still correctly classified. But if you look at everything above 0.5, we get these three correctly classified, but these three or four X's here are actually belonging to class zero, predicted as class zero, even though they're class one. And maybe even the worst part of this is that Although it tries really hard to incorporate these three into class zero, it never achieves it. They still get classified as class one. So we get a bunch of mistakes by doing this in logistic regression, having these outliers. So again, problematic scenario. Let's look at k-nearest neighbors, another friendly face. So with k-nearest neighbors, if we have two nice looking clouds of data, so we have the blue triangles and we have the green circles, then we can draw a pretty nice looking decision boundary. Any point on this side of the decision boundary, so above it, is going to get classified as a green circle because if we use, let's say, k equals three, who are my three closest neighbors, they're always going to be some of the circles if we're on this side, and they're always going to be the triangles if we're on this side. So no issues there. 
Let's see how this story changes if we incorporate just two extra green circles in the wrong place, so they're outliers. So here we have put the two green circles with the main pack of blue triangles. And we see that the decision boundary changes in the following way. So this whole area is unaffected, this whole area is unaffected, but around where we introduce the outliers, we get a very funky looking decision boundary. And the reason is that let's say you're trying to predict some new data point here where the X is, and you ask who are my three closest neighbors? Well, it's gonna be these two outliers as well as this blue triangle. So it's gonna say majority class is green circle. And so this whole decision space gets allocated to these circles as well. So we see that in k-nearest neighbor, introducing just a couple of outliers near a different class can have a big impact on the decision boundary. Now we've talked about so far uh, machine learning methods that are very impacted by outliers. Let's talk about one that is not so affected by outliers and that is our old friend decision trees. So we have decision tree here. This is just some variable. So we see that in general, low values of this variable correspond to these triangles. Higher values of these variables correspond to the circles, but there are two outliers where the variable is very high, yet those are classified as triangles. And so if we recall how decision trees work, it's going to scan this entire variable's range, and it's going to pick a split such that on one side of the split we have mostly triangles, and on the other side of the split we have mostly circles. So let's pretend at first it chooses this split here, so this black line that I've drawn. On the left-hand side, it's getting 100% correct because it's saying those are triangles, and they are indeed triangles. On the right-hand side, it's getting most of them correct, but it's doing poorly. It's misclassifying the two outliers. So the natural question is, is there a different split that I could try to get even a better outcome? And the answer is no. For example, let's just try hypothetically, what if it chose to split here instead? Well, if we did kind of entertain the idea that the decision tree could be swayed by outliers, maybe we think the decision boundary would get pulled in that direction. Let's think about if that actually makes sense in the context of decision trees. So if we have this as our split, and we say everything on the left-hand side is a triangle, we're still getting all these correct, but now we get an extra mistake with this green circle. And if we say everything on the right-hand side is a circle, we're still getting these three circles correct, but we're still getting those two triangles wrong. So all we've done by changing the location of the split is just introduce one more mistake. So we see a decision tree wouldn't actually ever do this. So this is not possible for the decision tree to split. And so we see that even if you have outliers, like these two triangles, and no matter how far they are in that direction, it's not going to matter. Whereas in logistic regression, the further these outliers were in that direction, the more the sigmoid gets stretched out and the more mistakes we are making. So that's why if you hear decision trees and everything that comes from them, like random forests and bagging and boosting are somehow resilient or robust to outliers, this is kind of the behavior that we are talking about. And now to close this video, let's talk about two very common strategies people use to deal with outliers. Let's talk about the pros and cons of them, and let's talk about the general con of doing anything to your outliers to end the video. So the two main strategies that people use to deal with outliers, the first is called trimming. This is probably the one you're more familiar with. So let's say this is our data. So this is some variable, and you're looking at a histogram of that variable. Trimming basically operates under the assumption that any very low values of that variable or any abnormally high values of that variable should be deleted. So for example, if we choose our thresholds as the fifth percentile and the 95th percentile, anything before the fifth and anything after the 95th, we just throw it away. And so a natural question now is what does that do to the histogram? So we go from this histogram to this one, so you can see the tails have been chopped off. And also what happens to the rest of the distribution is that it all gets raised slightly. So an intuitive way to think about it is we take the probability from the tails away, so that's gone, but we still need to have the curve integrate to one, it has to add up to 100% probability. So we take that probability we just deleted and we reallocate it to the rest of the curve, so the rest of the curve shifts up. So that is trimming. Now the downside of trimming, you probably notice, is that we are literally just throwing away data. In cases where you maybe don't have a ton of data to begin with, this could be a problem. And that's where the second strategy, which is related, but has a very different step at the end, and this is called Windsorizing, probably named after somebody called Windsor. And so the first part is the same. We still pick low and high thresholds. We'll just pick 5 and 95 again. But the big difference is that we don't delete the data on either side of the threshold. We take the stuff that's below 5th percentile, and we set it equal to the 5th percentile. And so the intuition here is that we're saying, Anything below the fifth percentile is in some sense abnormal or unexpected is kind of not the normal. 
So what we're going to do is take all those values and set them to the most reasonable value that does exist in the data set that we think is normal, and that would be the fifth percentile. So we take all this data in the tail and we set it equal to the fifth percentile and we do the same thing on the other side. We take everything above the 95th percentile and we set it equal to the 95th percentile. Now let's ask the same question. What does that do to the histogram afterwards? Well, we haven't deleted any data in this case. We still have the same number of observations. So the only change is that these values, the fifth percentile and the 95th percentile that we had up here, are both going to get boosted. They're going to get raised because now we just have a lot more observations at exactly those values. So the advantage here is that we're not throwing away data like we are in trimming, but the disadvantage is that we could potentially have a lot of samples now that are exactly the same, either exactly the fifth or exactly the 95th percentile. So we might be artificially reducing the variance of our data. So these are the trade-offs in these two methods. And now just to close this video, I want to talk about the general downside of doing any kind of default method with your outliers. So there's a lot of programming languages out there. There's a lot of packages to deal with outliers. You can do trimming, you can do Windsoring, you can do probably even more complex things to take your outliers and transform them into something else. But you have to stop and think. Anytime you're taking an outlier and transforming it into something else, you're inherently making this assumption that you're never going to see these type of outliers again, for example, in your testing data. Because if we think about it for a second, we're saying that these values are abnormal. We probably won't see them again. They're just kind of a one-off thing. And so we're going to do something reasonable to them. But that may not be the case. It may be the case that if you look at your testing data, the things you're trying to predict, you could still see outliers just like this. And if you haven't done anything to address the root cause or mechanism that produced these outliers, then you're never going to get those correct in the testing data because you just haven't built anything to deal with them. And even more than that, you're probably going to get them very wrong because you're treating them in the training data as just regular examples instead of anything special. And so you're probably going to have big errors when it comes to your testing data. So a lot of times students will come to me and ask, what's the right way to deal with outliers? And they're usually trying to choose between some of these out-of-the-box techniques. And I would say that none of these are the right way to deal with outliers. All these out-of-the-box techniques are the fast, easy way to deal with outliers if you want to make quick progress in your project. But the right way to deal with outliers is to stop, take some time, think about what is the mechanism that produced these outliers? Could that mechanism still exist in the testing data? And if so, we should do something more intelligent. We should look at how the outliers differ from the rest of the data and perhaps build a separate model or treat them in a different way. So hopefully you learned about outliers in the context of machine learning. So both which models are and are usually not affected by outliers, some out of the box techniques to do with outliers and the pros and cons between them. And most importantly, just the philosophy of what it means to do anything to an outlier at all and what consequences it can have for your entire data project. Okay. So if you uh, enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe for more just like this, and I'll see you next time.